Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back to the to Purpose Code Colloquium. Today we are very pleased and honored to have Dominic Orchard, and he will be talking about programming for the planet. And so, uh, Dominic, whenever you are ready. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me. So I'd like to start by showing uh, a few visualizations and graphs to kind of set the scene before I, I get into the meat of the talk. So um, the first one is perhaps uh, familiar to some of you. It's called the Warming Stripes Visualization by Ed Hawkins at uh, the University of Reading. And uh, it, it really kind of captures the long-term trends of global warming uh, that we've observed since, since 1850. So each stripe it corresponds to a year, and it's coloured based on the temperature change, change relative to a mean that's taken between sort of 1971 and 2000. So blue means it was cooler than that time, and red means it was hotter. So it captures really nicely uh, this, this warming that we've seen, particularly in the last uh, decade and a half. The second graph I'd like to show you uh, is also about increases. Uh, in this case, it's showing a very rapid increase in atmospheric CO2, uh, in the last 70 years, so that this uh, this time scale is over um, 10,000 years, um, and it shows that the the atmospheric CO2 was kind of pootling along around 250 to 260, and then we see this very rapid spike coming up from sort of 1950 onwards. Now these uh, visualizations they, they they come from data sets that are observational. The next thing I'd like to show you contrasts this kind of observational data with the results from computer simulations. Uh, I'm just seeing that people are saying the slides are not uh, showing in Zoom. So I'm just going to pause while we deal with that technical situation. Uh, sorry, Dominic, maybe it's my mistake, but uh, for me, it's only showing a tiny little uh, person in Zoom instead of showing the whole, so I cannot see the slides properly on Zoom, uh, shall we? I'm sorry about that. Um, the thing to do on yeah, Zoom, let, might me, let me do that. Me. Yeah, I think I, I, I'm going to try to fix that. Uh, okay, is this better, Valeria? That's right. That's wonderful now. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I understand what's going on now. Thank you. Thanks, Valeria. Hopefully on the YouTube, that will also still have me. Um, yes, looks like it does. Great. Yeah, now, now it's okay. Sorry about that, Dominic. Yeah, no worries. No worries. These these things happen. Um, great. So, um, so these were two observational um, kind of data sets. The next graph I'm going to show you uh, contrasts this kind of data with the results from climate simulations. So this is a graph from the latest IPCC report. Uh, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They've had um, six assessment reports uh, starting in 1990, sort of every five years or so. And um, uh, there's a number of things to, to explain here. So um, the, the, the first thing to look at is this black line in the middle. Uh, that uh, kind of goes along and is a sort of a jagged line uh, that goes up to the right. Uh, now this is the observed, uh, this is the observed temperature increase over pre-industrial uh, baseline. So the, the y-axis, sorry, this is the, the temperature in increase over that, over that baseline. So we've got this kind of the, the, the quantitative part of the, the warming stripes, the actual numerical data there shown going up, um, up to, this is up to 2020. Now overlaid here is this, this brown part that's uh, tracking very closely with this black line. So there's, there's a, a thin line that's very close to it. And that is the average prediction from a, a whole host, a, a large collection of models. That's their prediction, that's the mean of their predictions for the um, rise in uh, mean global surface temperature. So we can see that that tracks very closely with the black line. Um, the observed is very close to the, the mean of, our, of all of our simulations. And this kind of, this uh, colored bit that goes around the side of it is really shows this, the spread of predictions going up. Um, so it's, that's the kind of, the, the range that those predictions are in from a whole group of models. Now, this is a, these are simulations which include both human and natural factors of uh, uh, greenhouse gases and energy being put into the system. 
So we can contrast this with simulations where we took out anthrop anthropogenic emissions. We took out CO2 and methane and, and sulfur and all these other kinds of things. Uh, we took those out of, out of the simulations. And that's the green line at the bottom, which stays roughly around the kind of zero line, again, with a bit of a spread. So this is part of our evidence that we have that the warming that we see in the atmosphere is as a result of anthropogenic emissions. This gives us really clear evidence uh, that the, all of the energy we're inputting into the system from, from um, that's being input into the system from our emissions uh, is, is what's causing this warming. And this is really a remarkable graph because it just brings together so much science and so much computation and modeling and software and programming and maths into one single thing. This is really representing such a huge endeavor uh, captured in this one graph. And we're going to sort of drill down on some of the, the, the things going on here uh, in this talk. Now, another really interesting graphic from the uh, IPCC report is something that looks at uh, different scenarios um, from, uh, from climate models, uh, applying different potential things that could happen going forwards from now based on uh, what we do in terms of our emissions. So the, they're called shared socioeconomic pathways. The blue line down here at the bottom, 1.9, is uh, what happens if we reach net zero uh, emissions by 2050. And we see that we get to about, the, the models tell us we get to about just above 1.5 temperature increase, and then it goes down towards the end of the century. And maybe if we miss that, we get a serious reduction. Okay, we go ab above 1.5, that's the dark blue line, 2.6. Um, and that has a, uh, this one has the range on it. That's what the, um, the, uh, the, the blue shading is. That tells us that the, the likely range that we would be in then. Now, the other situations are, are much more dire, as you can tell. Oranges, we kind of keep going as uh, you know, business as usual until 2050, and then reach net zero by 2100. That's already a very serious amount of warming, uh, and the other situations are kind of almost not worth thinking about because they're, they're really quite drastic. Now, these are, these are models then that are, are taking forward what might happen in the future based on what we do now. So these are really important predictions as well, that are generated from um, our, our best uh, climate models. Now, we should also, uh, as well as the, the problems of climate change and global warming, there are other interlinked crises. Biodiversity loss is something that we've been seeing a lot for uh, 100 years, decreases amongst uh, the number of species and the population within species, and also desertification. That's the, the, the eroding um, of the, the quality of our land, particularly in arid and semi-arid areas. And these are, these are all linked together, but these are also very serious crises that uh, governments around the world are, are spending a lot of time discussing together at uh, meetings called the Conference of the Parties. There are, there are separate ones for different issues. So the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, summarized uh, the situation really well here, I think. Uh, we are in this race and it's a race we are losing, but it's a race we can win. And I remain very optimistic about what we can do going forward, but we really have to move faster than we are now, and we have to change a lot of our systems. A really fantastic book, which I'm going to mention again at the end, uh, it came out this year by Simon Sharp called Five Times Faster. It starts off with, with looking at the, the evidence that we do indeed need to, to change things five times faster than we are now. And he goes through in, in three sections, looking at how we need to rethink the structure of scientific inquiry uh, in this area, uh, how we do economics differently, and then how that feeds into diplomacy and policy. And I definitely recommend anyone uh, to take a look at this book if they're interested about how to change the systems we have to actually affect uh, change in the, in the system to, to address these problems. And he has this great quote, which it's kind of really motivates nicely what I'm going to talk about. He makes a point in the first part of the book that um, science often deals with generating predictions, but actually policy is often better informed by risk assessments. And I'm not going to get too much into that argument here, um, but I will kind of touch on it occasionally. Risk assessments are more along the lines of what's the probability that this bad thing will happen, whereas our predictions tend to be a bit more, well, we, we understood that we understood nature, we ran the simulation forward, and this is what happens. 
But he has this nice quote, still our appreciation of the risks of climate change is limited by the way our academic institutions encourage each researcher to focus on their own narrow area of expertise. Now, I'm a computer scientist by, by background, by training. I, I did my PhD in programming languages and semantics, type theory, logic, category theory. Um, but when I uh, finished that and um, was thinking about what to do next, I, I started talking a lot with climate scientists and seeing like, okay, their primary job is programming. They do programming all day. And why isn't why aren't more programming language people talking to them? And it was because of this kind of siloing um, that, that happened and it naturally happens. But that got me uh, down the path of thinking, okay, we need to start talking uh, with our colleagues in, in earth, earth sciences. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, um, we established this Institute of Computing for Climate Science. So I, I work partly at the University of Cambridge uh, running this and partly at the University of Kent. And our goal really with ICCS was to maximize, uh, is to maximize the effectiveness of climate science research via the feed-in of all these other disciplines, computer science and the subparts of it, like programming languages and systems, machine learning, data science, software engineering, mathematics, really bringing people together uh, from all these disciplines, uh, because all of these disciplines are really important and critical to doing good climate science. And we felt there was not, not enough um, uh, dialogue between, between some of these groups. We wanted to, to bring researchers together uh, to do to do more of that cross disciplinary dialogue. So that's reflected in our directorship. Um, we're guided by Emily Shockborough, who's a climate scientist. She leads Cambridge Zero, but she also sits with me in computer science. Colin Caulfield is the head of the uh, Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics Department. Chris Edsall heads up the Research Software Engineering team at the university. And Marla is our executive uh, program director, helping us uh, steer this whole thing. And uh, we're very grateful for the support of Schmidt Futures uh, to, to get going with this. And they established uh, another institute called the Virtual Earth System Research Institute, uh, which funded, uh, which has funded now six uh, international climate science projects, uh, which each comprise uh, several universities working together across borders, uh, building the next generation of climate science models. And we work very closely with all of these teams um, uh, on short-term projects and long-term projects, helping them with their science. So we have this kind of sort of multi-tiered model operating at, I think I like to say, sort of think of them as different speeds and different timeframes. So one of the things we have in the Institute is a team of research software engineers. These are trained uh, software engineers who have been working in a research context for a while, and they work very closely with the science teams in the Virtual Earth System Research Institute. And there we can have some sort of immediate impact at the scale of six months to two years kind of projects, helping them with the latest climate models. From this, we then look at what are the, 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 the problems behind the problems? What are the cross-cutting things that could help in there in multiple projects or, or more broadly? And we have uh, three advanced, uh, advanced fellow postdocs um, at the Institute across uh, climate science, mathematics, and computer science, who then work at this level of thinking about the next few years and, and bringing these things together. And then this feeds up into the longer range thinking, how do we support climate science for the next five to 30 years? And I'm gonna talk about some of the ideas um, uh, there today. So my work within this uh, is kind of, I like to think of myself as floating up and down between the levels. I like to sit in the conversations, uh, that's engineering conversations with the scientists, but also think about the, the longer range problems as well. So I think of my work as building the tools for the tool makers who then support the decision making, our understanding, uh, the forecasting and monitoring of our climate system. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to give you a bit more background about climate modeling and, and give you some kind of history and some context there, and then look at some of the challenges that are facing uh, the, next, the next sort of wave of climate models. I'm going to then go into a few sort of more mathematical programming language, just kind of technical details. And okay, this is the Topos Institute colloquium. So I have some category theory in there, don't worry. Uh, that's that gonna be part two there. And then sort of land with some, some more general ideas for the future. So I'm gonna start a hundred years ago with this wonderful paper by a uh, British scientist, Lewis Fry Richardson, who um, envisaged this uh, modeling system uh, a computational system that could 
predict the weather of the entire planet over short, medium, and long-term scales. And he described, it's a very poetic, a beautiful description that I don't have time to read out to you, but he kind of envisaged this human computer. Of course, back then, computers were people. And it's this great spherical building with these grid squares representing different parts of the globe with numbers being projected on them. And then these computers, these people sitting around the edge on the outside, looking at those numbers, looking at their neighbors and computing the updates based on physical equations that describe the motions of fluids and, and, and describe the weather patterns. So he's really saying, you know, people who in other areas of physics, like uh, the motion of planets, they've got these equations that can predict how planets move. We could do the same with the, with the weather, and then we can compute these predictions. We just need to bring all of the data together and coordinate it. And in this 1920s way, he, what he was describing is really like the, the global large climate models we have today, but that are run on actual computer hardware. And indeed, it wasn't long, 20 years after this, that we built our first uh, electrical uh, electronic computers. And uh, following the Second World War, one of the first things um, that people did once they had these, these working computers is to say, oh, great, now we can do numerical weather prediction accurately. So John von Neumann, along with Jules Sharney at the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, um, they, they had this stored computer. And the first thing they did was, OK, let's start doing numerical weather prediction. And really, I think this shows that you know, climate science and computer science really grew up together. Computer science grew out of these scientific disciplines and wanting to compute predictions to complex models uh, and understand the world better. And then at some point, we've, we've somewhat drifted apart, perhaps not in, in high performance computing, but in other areas, there's been a kind of drift. So let's jump forwards from there 20 years. And uh, at, uh, there was the founding a little bit afterwards, um, John von Neumann and another person, Smagorinsky, they, they founded the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. And out of that came the first climate models and climate predictions. And in this, this landmark paper uh, by uh, Sukuru Manabe and Weatherold, they showed that according to our estimates, a doubling of the CO2 content in the atmosphere has the effect of raising the temperature of the atmosphere by two degrees. They did the first uh, atmospheric climate model, looking at that relationship between atmospheric CO2 and the, the global uh, mean surface temperatures. Now, the science for this was already 100 years old at that point. Tyndale had done the uh, greenhouse, uh, had proposed the greenhouse gas effect, shown the experiments, shown the effect that CO2 has in, in capturing and radiating heat. But it was this, it was 100 years later when we had this, this first model that really related that that to the entire uh, global system. And indeed, that's that prediction, that analysis is essentially what we've now seen observationally, particularly in the last decade. A little bit afterwards, um, uh, Sukuro and uh, another researcher built their, what's, the, what's seen as a, a kind of a landmark in milestone in scientific computing, uh, a model that coupled an ocean, uh, an ocean model and an atmospheric model together. Um, and uh, this this was also, this was quite revolutionary and looked at and looked again at these climate calculations. Now, uh, modern climate models, uh, the, the typical name for them is the GCMs, global circulation models. They have a much more complex view. It's not just this kind of uh, simple land piece and simple uh, ocean piece kind of stuck together. They simulate the entire globe with a a uh, sort of spherical uh, grid layout, a horizontal grid that then has vertical layers, capturing ocean processes, atmospheric processes, sea ice, uh, the land contributions of, of a whole host of different processes, which, which I'll get into in a moment. Uh, there are lots of different ways of organizing this grid, um, but a, a very common way is to have this latitude, longitude view, a kind of a square grid uh, wrapping the globe and then with the vertical layers on top of that. And over time, with these GCMs, what we've uh, done is increase the resolution to get higher fidelity simulations. So uh, the models that were used in the IPCC reports, uh, the first one, first assessment report in 1990, the second, third, and the fourth, the resolution uh, increased by about five times over that over the course of that uh, those assessment exercises. So by the time we're at 2007, we're looking at a, roughly 100 kilometers by 100 kilometer. Uh, square grids. 
Um, skipping to the, the last one, uh, we've, we've got even higher resolution. So this is a plot from one of the reports. Um, so uh, this is based on something called the coupled model into comparison project. So these are coupled models, again, this is atmosphere ocean. Uh, there's about 50 models that fed into this. And the average uh, resolution there is about 75 by 75 for the atmosphere. Um, and uh, sorry, uh, at 100, 100 ish uh, for the atmosphere and about 75, 75 for the ocean. And then there's a very high resolution uh, in model into comparison project as well, which gets even close to about 10, 10 kilometer resolution. Now that's extremely computationally expensive, but there are a lot of things that happen below that resolution. There are a lot of things that happen below the 10 by 10 space. So uh, for example, walls in the ocean, they're called ocean eddies, these things that spiral around, they transfer a lot of heat, um, energy, momentum up and down throughout the, the, the um, ocean, they lead to mixing. Clouds as well, they are a transporter of moisture and energy in the atmosphere, and some of them are much smaller than 10 by 10 kilometers, but they still have an effect. So what gets done is there are um, what are called subgrid models, um, also called parameterizations, which then approximate these processes that are happening below the resolution of the climate model. And they're really important for capturing lots of processes. Problem is that you, they, they are approximations. And so that's where uncertainty can creep in and where, uh, where there's some kind of error. And then it's a trade-off between how expensive how much time can we spend computing these things versus how much uncertainty are we going to introduce? Um, the nice thing with, with all of these reports that we see, all that uncertainty is captured and described. So we're not, we're not just leaving that out. It's the uncertainty is understood and included in these predictions. So I'm going to give you this kind of, this kind of overview that, that just kind of contextualizes some of the things that then go into a climate model. Um, you can think of them as being a solution to a conservation law, which we can represent in a, in a continuum form. So we have some set of time varying, uh, time dependent variables, 3D variables, phi, which are the things that we care about that we want to measure. Things like pressure, temperature, wind speed, moisture, precipitation, humidity. And then... Uh, this conservation uh, equation relates those to a number of other factors. So the D here is represents the, the fluid dynamics that the, the, um, are over those variables. So there we take the equations of fluid motion and we do some approximate solution. These are described by partial differential equations. So we have to come up with an approximation to them. And that captures the movement of fluids in the atmosphere. And we do that to this resolution that we have, this sort of maximum resolution, say 10K by 10K. And we then include other processes. So radiative transfer, that's when photons are absorbed by the atmosphere and then reflected down and up. Convection, that's things moving along a, a density gradient. Chemistry, uh, aerosols in the atmosphere and, and then being um, uh, disassociated or things moving up from the ground, carbon being released, released from the ground and so on. And then the, the, the U component here is the unresolved processes. These are the things that are below that resolution of the dynamics. That's our subgrid processes, things like the clouds and the eddies. And then this term F is added in here. This is the four, this is called the forcings. These are the external factors. This is the, the, um, the things coming into the system that aren't captured by its dynamics. So that's the sun's radiation coming in called insulation. That's where all the energy comes from. That's or well, most of the energy comes from the sun. A bit of energy comes from geothermal heating. And then we add in there the anthropogenic emissions into our simulations. So GCMs or climate models in general are solutions to this kind of equation over this uh, three dimensional sphere of our grid. And I think as things that humanity has constructed, these are, these are kind of beautiful things. It's the aggregation of humanity's understanding of our planet and its processes and everything that we've got here through lots and lots of collaboration, then rendered into a computational model from which we generate predictions about our planet and where we're going with it and what, what we're doing to it and what we need to do to ensure the future of our species. And so that's a really beautiful thing to have this, this artifact from all of this human endeavor. 
There's a wonderful paper, if you're kind of interested more in the structure of them, uh, it's called The Software Architecture of Climate Models by Alexander and Easterbrook. Um, it has these nice graphics that kind of summarize a bit about the structure of them. So uh, uh, a model that's, that's used a lot and used in the IPCC reports is the CESM model, the Community Earth System model. And uh, this graphic kind of just describes about its shape and structure. You have the atmospheric part, uh, called CAM, which has a kind of chemistry component. You've got an ocean part, you've got a land part, you've got a sea ice, and then they interact via this kind of central coupler unit. And uh, okay, there's some representations of some other models here from GFDL, from NASA, with different sort of architectures uh, and different structures. Um, all of these are roughly on the order of a million lines of code or so. Uh, and there are other kinds of models as well. Um, some of them are what we call intermediate complexity models, uh, like this one here, that may be at the, the level of uh, hundreds of thousands of lines of code, which uh, let us study particular weather patterns uh, in more detail. They may be remove some of the other details so that we can focus down on the bits that we care about. Um, and we should recall the phrase uh, from statistics, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, with our models, we're always trying to, to, to find the useful thing and focus on the parts that we're interested in. Um, so lots of intermediate complexity models get built as well, as well as the large GCMs. Now, in the early days, uh, Jules Sharney from uh, the Institute of Advanced Study, he spoke about, well, what we need to do now is climb the ladder of complexity. We've got the computers, we can do numerical weather prediction, do climate predictions. Now we need to add more and more processes and increase the resolution and keep increasing the resolution. And that, we just keep doing that and we'll, we'll really understand what's going on. So perhaps at the top of this ladder, the golden egg of what we might want is to have climate models at one kilometer resolution with every kind of process captured and data assimilation continuously. That's where we take observational data from remote sensors, from satellites, and keep putting it in to correct forecasts. And that's a whole other topic, which I don't have a lot of time to speak about, but I'll mention again at the end. We want to work at different scales. So to be able to do climate predictions over the next 100 years, as well as weather forecasts for the next week in the same model. And we want to have good uncertainty quantification there as well as well as perhaps being able to do risk assessments for policymakers. So this is a scale up challenge. And I contend that this breaks down into some other tricky uh, sort of scaling problems, uh, scaling computation, scaling collaboration, and scaling communication. So I'll unpack those a bit and probably spend more time on the last one. So scaling computation, right? We want to increase the resolution. Well, what does that mean computationally? So say I want to double the horizontal resolution, I want to go from 10 kilometers to five kilometers. So I'm gonna take this delta X, that's our like resolution and divide it, uh, divide it by two. So I want to go from 10 to five. Now this means that in a horizontal layer, I actually need four times the grid points, of course, because we're, we're gonna do that in both dimensions. And typically we, want, we use square grids. So um, uh, delta X and delta Y are the same. But then we actually need to increase the number of time steps, because if you think about the speed of propagation of a wave, if we're decreasing the size, well, it's going to travel across that smaller uh, space uh, more quickly than it did across the bigger space. So we do a little bit of uh, sort of, sort of calculations, thinking about the maximum speed of propagation there, and we see, okay, well, we need to at least double our number of time steps. There's a bunch of very interesting uh, maths in there, um, looking at uh, stability of of numerical solutions uh, and, and this time stepping. So if you're interested in that, look at the uh, CFL conditions, uh, but uh, the approximation is, okay, we'll roughly, we'll need to double the number of time steps. So, okay, we wanted to double the resolution. That's eight times more computation. And that's even before we consider the vertical. So maybe we end up with 16 times more computation. So that doubling really uh, has a, you know, to the, to the power of three or to the power of four effect. And then, of course, we might want to test more scenarios. That's another part of the scaling up. We want to test more pathways. Perhaps we want to do more uncertainty estimation. These are called ensemble runs, where we do lots of runs with tweaks to the parameters to get a kind of uh, a spread, an estimate of, of the envelope of, of, of um, the, the regime. Um, and also, maybe we want to do more short-term forecasting. So this is a lot more computation. Now, unfortunately, um, we 
have lost a bit of a free lunch that we used to have in the old days. Uh, a long time ago, we could wait a, some, for some time, buy a new computer, and it would be faster, and we could just run the same code that we had before, and we could run it faster and higher resolution. That was due to Moore's law, this, this scaling, uh, this scaling um, law behavior that was observed uh, that every 18 months, the number of transistors on a chip was doubling, and that was also uh, leading to an increase in frequency. Uh, which is related to another thing called Denard scaling, a relationship between the, the frequency and the power density. But this Denard scaling tailed off and kind of became, basically went away uh, in the mid 2000s. So whilst we could still fit more transistors onto a chip, we couldn't make each, we couldn't make the cores faster. And so the sort of hardware vendors uh, response to this was to increase the number of cores, go sort of parallel on a single chip. But then that means re-architecting re your software. You can't just get the free lunch of wait a bit of time, buy a big, buy a new computer, or it ran faster so I can up the resolution. We've got to this point where that kind of performance is plateauing, and then it, we have to go to really thinking about the parallel architecture. And that's something that, that climate modelers have done for a long time. They've always worked in this parallel situation that adds another layer of parallelization that needs to be de dealt with. Uh, and uh, if you want to know more, there's a, there's a nice paper about this called Are General Circulation Models Obsolete? The answer is no, but it kind of unpacks this, this situation a bit more. So we have this challenge of uh, we need to scale up our computation, but it isn't as easy as it used to be. Now, an interesting thing that's arisen in the last five to seven years is the use of machine learning uh, in climate modeling. So one thing that people are doing with uh, a lot of success is to take these subgrid models we were talking about before, these things that were, were sort of approximate mechanistic models of what's happening below this uh, resolution that we could resolve. And it's been shown for various processes that what you can do instead is take a neural network and train it on observational data or on a very high resolution simulation and plug this in and you get one of either faster, uh, faster uh, simulation or um, better scientific prediction, better skill, and sometimes even better, both. So it's faster and it predicts, and it predicts better than it did before. Sometimes it's a bit of a trade-off. Maybe you're happy to take a loss in predictive skill, but it's faster if you want to do a lot of fast forecasting on ensemble runs. Um, maybe you're happy with a slower but better predictive performance if you're really trying to get a very precise thing. But it's given an interesting new uh, um, uh, device in our tool in our toolbox to 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 play with this spectrum between precision and speed. But this comes up with other questions about its explainability. Can we then understand what it does because it's, it's a bit of a black box? How well does it generalize to situations that haven't been seen before? And then there are also technical challenges, um, which we've been working a lot on with our teams about essentially coupling together Fortran code with these Python-based ML toolkits, how to do that efficiently. So that's scaling computation. Uh, next one is going to spend less time on, that's the scaling collaboration. We've got these large models that we're trying to build that require um, cooperation between a number of scientists all around the world, lots of different teams, lots of different bits of software, uh, all working together. Now, the field of software engineering has developed loads of great tools and techniques to help us manage that kind of situation, working together globally in teams to build complex software. So processes like agile methodologies, version control systems that are often open source as well to help us manage that collaboration, containerization and, and build systems to help us deploy and build things in an automated way, as well as lots of other tools. And we're seeing an increasing use of these in climate science which is fantastic and is really sort of enabling people to do their work more easily. And something we're doing in ICCS is, is helping to deploy those and helping to train people in their use. Alongside that, there's been a lot of uh, cultural, sociological change uh, within various countries about the role of software in research. So in the UK, there's uh, something called the Software Sustainability Institute that was set up about 10 years ago to promote the importance of software to research in all fields. They have this beautiful slogan, better software, better research, I think really captures um, uh, the sentiment really well. And, and they've um, worked a lot with the government. And now there's, there's this recognition within funding bodies of this role that some people have of a research software engineer. They work in research 
but they're doing a lot of software engineering and it's absolutely critical. And we need to spend more time funding that, training people up uh, and giving people a, a career path as well within that route. And this has been growing uh, in the US as well. And there's been lots of other um, things that have sprung up. So grassroots training um, as well, like software carpentry and resources like the Turing Way. So this is fantastic. This is bringing the software engineering tools to help people collaborate better. Now, this feeds into the, the area that I've worked in for a long time, which is about languages. And this comes to scaling communication. In the past, with people with fancy wigs, you did some science and you came up with a model and that model was an equation. And you could share that and people could uh, generate predictions from that. And it was nice and contained. But what we've been describing so far, the models are now these large, quite complicated beasts, maybe one to two million lines of code. And that's the model. That's really the model now. There are lots of mathematics that go into that that are perhaps distributed around the papers. But the thing that is the complete model is that, that code artifact. And we can share that and open and uh, you know, the, 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 the push towards open science and open source has been fantastic in, in helping that be uh, open to everyone so we can sort of really build on uh, the shoulders of giants. Now, our languages then are really critical because our programming languages are now the language of our models, of our climate models. And they have to handle two levels of complexity. There's the inherent complexity of the models, but there's also the accidental complexity that gets introduced in developing these things that can produce predictions at speed. And my contention is that our languages, although they have evolved a lot and developed in nice ways, they still don't really support that inherent complexity that well. And it's also too easy to introduce accidental complexity. Oops, sorry. I... There we go. So both of these hinder the scientific, uh, scientific progress. Only one of those is necessary, the inherent complexity. And one of the issues I think that comes about is this sort of relationship between the mathematical part that we perhaps start off with, these conservation equations, and then the implementation. We get a sort of loss of the abstract meaning when we go down to code. So as a really uh, quick and simple example, uh, here's a conservation equation uh, that, that governs, uh, it's a heat equation in one dimension. We can bust out our numerical analysis textbook and, and come up with a discrete approximation for that. And then we can go ahead and implement it in our favorite language like Fortran and generate predictions from it in a fast way. But there's not much relationship or not very clear relationship then between the abstract model, uh, this uh, mathematical specification and our prediction. But there might be some way to kind of read between the solution so strategy and the prediction. But then our prediction calculation, we might start adding in parallelization using uh, some libraries like uh, OpenMP, MPI. And then we add in all of these other things that make it further and further away from the abstract world. And then we might start introducing bugs or hidden assumptions that uh, then further divorce us from this abstract model. And our papers then typically capture the abstract thing while it's our programs that have the prediction ca calculation. And then there's sort of gap between the two, this gap in the meaning explanation. So we have this sort of this open problem here. We want to separate concerns within, within the, the programs to sort of separate out the essential ideas of the model from the sort of do things fast kind of parallel parts. But then we also want to be able to relate this back to our initial abstractions. So we could have extra documentation, have better systems design, make it more modular, and that will help. But I think there's more that we could do here. We could start thinking about languages that actually support uh, programming for science. Are there, are there things that we could be doing uh, to generate languages that are tailored towards science? I love this quote from Sir Tony Hoare from 1982. I don't know what the language of the year 2000 will look like, but I know it will be called Fortran. Well, it's 2023 and Fortran is the, one of the dominant languages in, of GCMs. In fact, I think almost all of the GCMs are written in Fortran. Python is very popular too for um, data analysis, machine learning parts and um, other intermediate complexity models. And, and you do see C++ used as well. And, and you can write really nice Fortran. The language has evolved a lot and it has um, really enabled us to write more complex software. Um, so you might say, okay, you know, are we done? We've got Python, C++ and Fortran. We just go on with this for the next 30 years, building more models, 
uh, having good forecast and understanding things using this. Is that enough? Well, we could have said that in 1954 when we had Fortran, but I think history has shown us that the evolution of languages has actually enabled us to solve complex problems more easily and collaborate and communicate with each other. So that can actually be seen within Fortran as well. It's a language that has evolved. It's got rid of some of the earlier uh, baggage, which was there for performance reasons, but is also leads to bugs. And it's evolved and it has enabled us to, to build these, these beautiful complex things. But I don't think we should stop there. We should think about new languages, but of course making new languages is hard. We don't just come up with some language in the lab and people use it. You know, a lot of engineering work has to go into it, community and libraries, and a lot of languages get made in a sort of research context. And the point is not for them to become popular. The point is to explore the ideas and then have success by infection, have these ideas leak out into other languages, which will eventually become popular. And I think a really exciting thing is to see when these new languages come, come along. So a recent breakout success is the Julia language, which is being used by uh, the Climate Project, which is between MIT and Caltech. And they're betting on that as their, their language for a new GCM. So they're building, they've been for the last five years plus, been building everything out of Julia. And that's really exciting. New language coming along with new ideas. A lot of the scientists have been involved in its development, and that's and that's proving to be have a lot of new interesting ideas that can help the science along. Perhaps this is a space where we can try out some, some new uh, wacky things as well. So I'm going to go through these three uh, kind of things that we're working on now and get a bit more technical, looking at the role of languages and tools, uh, things that, that, that can help at the moment. Now, I've alluded to sort of bugs and problems with that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of climate models, uh, they, their software, they need to be tested because bugs can arise. And testing them is difficult. And despite huge amounts of progress in uh, verification tooling from programming languages, a lot of it, or basically all of it, is not deployable and is not deployed in this area. So a project we've had for a while is uh, looking at um, static analysis and lightweight verification techniques for, for climate scientists. So there's this kind of um, dichotomy that's, that's good to get clear between validation and verification. Validation is asking, did we implement the right equations? And verification is, did we implement the equations right? So if you build a model, and you run it and it doesn't behave as intended, maybe it's really different to observational data, you've got to ask yourself, well, is my science wrong? Did I implement the right equations? Or is my code wrong? Did I implement the equations right? And telling the two apart can be difficult, especially if you don't have any tools to help you with that verification part. And this is something that I, I started on over a decade ago. And we started talking to climate scientists. And we said, oh, we've got all these verification tools. They can help you. Uh, find and detect bugs in your code and remove them. And I said, oh, that's great. You know, bugs, bugs do happen. They slow us down. We, have, we spend a lot of time having to deal with that. We said, ah, oh, this is great. We have all of these tools like theorem provers, like uh, uh, Lean and, and Isabel Hall and all these other things. And you can you know, describe your programs and, and prove properties about them. And uh, did that go over well? Well, no, it didn't because of this big gap, this big gulf between our disciplines. And the tools that we've developed in uh, computer science, they're great. We've got SCL4 verified operating system kernels and Comcert verified C compilers, and all kinds of cool verification efforts going on, but it's largely inaccessible to practitioners working in the sciences. So we did a lot of talking and we tried to look for some low hanging fruit of things we could provide. And looking through the climate models, one thing we noticed was a lot of comments about units of measure information. And I remember a postdoc saying, oh, yeah, 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 they, those are useful, but some of these comments are wrong. Um, we said, oh, well, there's been great work in the 90s. Andrew Kennedy looked at how units of measure analysis is a kind of type system property. You can build a type theory to check units of measure properties of programs. And he said, that sounds great if we could automate that. So we built a tool called CamFort, um, which uh, as you write comments into your Fortran code, there's sort of lightweight specifications that describe the units. Uh, so this example here is saying, okay, the mass is a kilogram on line two, line three, the, the height is meters, uh, and then line five, potential energy is uh, this thing. And then you can run our tool, 
It does a, a static analysis, sort of quite traditional static analysis over the source code. Then there's a bunch of constraint solving and checks whether your code is dimensionally and units of measure consistent. And we wanted this to be able to integrate with existing models. So you've got your 2 million lines uh, Met Office unified weather model. You want to be able to add it easily. You don't want to have to annotate every variable. And you don't want to um, uh, have to try and work out which variables need adding either. So we have, uh, it does inference for you. It has polymorphism. It can even suggest to you the minimum set of variables which you need to give annotations to such that it can solve the entire constraint set. So we call this sort of the critical uh, uh, variable set. Um, so uh, we're, we're starting to use that a, a bit more with Teams uh, uh, to, to kind of provide that, that little bit of extra verification. Did we actually do the, the, the physically consistent thing? We had a really, on the back of this, we looked at other verification tools. So Camford is really a suite of things. Um, we had a nice project with the Met Office where we, we showed them this. And they said, ah, well, we have all of these other uh, coding standards that we want our developers to follow, but it would be great if they could be automated. So we built some things into Camfort so that they could be automatically checked. So you could run the tool on the Met Office code. Um, I think it was run in their nightly build and it would give you the report of things that were potential sources of error. So uh, the idea there is, is, is to, to kind of in other analyses and other kinds of verification that we're, we're uh, taking forwards, and it's all really trying to do things that are targeted to science, that are in concert with the scientists and what they need. So the next thing uh, comes from thinking about how we write code in a way that doesn't overcommit to details, that doesn't bring in too much accidental complexity. So a lot of the models, they'll commit to a grid representation, and then everything else kind of has to hang around that. Uh, but sometimes we want to change the way that grids are structured or change their resolution or, or try and explore different uh, grid techniques. So what could be abstractions that could help avoid this? And this is where category theory becomes useful, giving us abstractions for common structures in, in languages and, and semantics and, and logic. So uh, I mentioned the fluid dynamics before. Here's a little uh, simulation here. This is solving the Navier-Stokes equations, and this is a uh, one of the kind of central set of equations for fluid motion. Uh, and we can, as I said before, you can do a discrete approximation of these. These are partial differential equations. And computationally, this looks like a pattern that's, that's well known, it's called a stencil computation. So what you do is you take an array and at a particular position, which is here marked um, with a sort of dark, uh, you can't see my cursor, but there's sort of a dark A in the middle of this, this plus, this cross. That's the sort of central point. You want to take in a neighborhood, uh, some local neighbors, and compute a new value for that position at the array um, of some other type, let's call it B. So, so you're looking at the, the pressure, the, the wind speed around you. You're going to compute from your neighbors the wind speed at the next time step for this position. And then you have typically, let's say you're writing Fortran code, you do some for loop that goes over the entire array. And at each position, we then calculate this the value for the for, for the um corresponding position in the output array. And this is called a stencil computation, very common in scientific applications. Uh, this is also uh, the pattern you have in uh, Conway's Game of Life or in other graphical applications. And we were looking at this, actually we were thinking uh, in a different paper, we were thinking about verifying the shape of these kind of things because they can get a bit complicated. And we did an analysis, uh, sort of medium-sized analysis of code over about 2.5 million physical lines of code, which was um, a mixture of climate models some, and some general uh, numerical libraries and some other geo, geophysics libraries uh, models. And we found that, yes, uh, as we expect, array computations are very common. There was um, 100, over 130,000 across all of these packages. But over half of those were stencil computations. They fit in this pattern of, you traverse over an array from some static neighborhood, you compute the output for the corresponding position in the output array. So that gave us uh, evidence that, okay, we should, we should do more. In this case, we were looking at verification, but this can also guide us to think, well, we should do more to help people um, abstract over these things and program with stencil computations. And the interesting thing, this is a work I did a while ago um, in my PhD, and it's also been noted by other people, stencil computations 
are chromanatic. They have fundamentally have the shape of a chromonat. So um, apologies if you don't know what a chromonat is. This might be a little bit fast, but essentially you've got um, you've got a functor, you've got an endofunctor, which I call D here. And in this case, we're thinking about an array over um, elements of type A, which is indexed by um, some set or some category of indices I. So you've got an array indexed by I, and you pair it with a cursor, which tells you sort of where you are right now. Then the chromonad operations, the co-unit operation, is the operation that extracts the, the value at the, at the cursor. It says, OK, read from the array at that cursor location. So that's the, uh, the epsilon operation there from DA to A. That's the co-unit of the chromonad. The co-multiplication, it's taking a DA into a DDA, and it does that by taking an array and replicating it at every position, but moving the cursor along to its corresponding location. So you start here, you've got a, in this picture, you've got a four by four array, and you end up with a four by four array of four by four arrays, but where the cursor is moved along at each location. This is a bit like what a for loop does in that it's visiting every part of the array. Now you can put these together to do a lifting of a local computation. This is the, the kernel of a stencil computation, which describes how from some local neighborhood you compute a new value, you can then lift this via the Komenad operations into a global computation that applies that kernel everywhere. And so that's derived from co-multiplication and, um, and the functor. So uh, I uh, take my local stencil computation, F, that goes DA to B, and I post-compose that with, uh, I lift that functorially and I pre-compose that um, uh, to that, I pre-compose co-multiplication. So co-multiplication sort of expands it out and, and gives this array where we're localized at every position. And then we lift our local computation to apply at each one of those positions. And that gives us the output array of the same size. And so that's a nice little way of understanding stencil computations via uh, a categorical um, concept. But okay, why would we do this? Well, there's lots of other things that we could then do, lots of other data structures that we would be useful to consider here. So for example, um, one thing that's typically done is to do a technique called double buffering, where you read from one ar array and you write to another. Well, we can capture that with a data structure that has an, a, a read array, uh, sort of a mutable array part, and a mutable array part, and a cursor. And then our operations, they a bit restricted now, there's a sort of endomorphisms, co cleisley endomorphisms, so they have to go from DA to A. Um, but this, uh, the idea is that we, this uh, function F, it reads from the I array, and the, uh, the lifting here writes the results into the mutable array, and then it swaps their position, kind of a freeze in the thaw. Now, this involves side effects. It's not very mathematical, it might sound, but these get completely encapsulated inside the comonad. So it is mathematically well behaved. We can't observe the side effects from the outside, but this mutation is happening inside and that, that, that's an optimization. We do this, this swapping round. So a general idea is that we could hide optimizations behind this abstract interface, like mutation or like other things that people do like stencil tiling. Now there are other data structures that people are interested in as well, not just these sort of square arrays. Something that can be done is to use uh, spatial data structures so that is, um, work on um, uh, kind of change the resolution depending on where you are in the, in the system. So quad trees are a common representation here where we have a tree of arrays, which we break up depending on how busy or noisy a space is. So say if you're doing a sea ice calculation, you, you might have thing, you want, want to do higher resolution around the coast or around the cracks in your sea ice. Uh, but where you've got a nice big block that's not doing much, you can course, you can course in that part. So when you're working on stencil computations over these things, they get difficult when your stencil has to cross different resolutions. But we could hide this inside a comonad. We'd have this sort of spatial uh, um, a comonad S, but then a comonad morphism that maps down to the flat view that we had before, the kind of simplified array view D. So we can lift this uh, Cocleisley, this, this local computation, the stencil computation we had before that goes DA to B, we can lift it to work on the spatial view with this comonad morphism that map, maps down from the spatial to the flat, doing any kind of scaling and interpolation that's needed. And then 
we use the S Comonad to lift the whole thing to run, run over that data structure. And then we could swap in different spatial data structures and play with kind of adaptive refinement. So again, the, the general idea is about hiding, right? That's what abstraction is for. The previous slide was about hiding optimizations. This is about hiding representation and using the homomorphisms. So this is something um, that I did work on before and that I'm kind of heating back up again, looking at these categorical abstractions for grids and, and building programs that are abstracted in this way. Um, and there are some nice models out there that use different grid configurations. So a nice um, sort of modern one is speedyweather.jl, which is a, a sort of fast intermediate complexity uh, weather model that's been implemented in Julia. And it deals with lots of different grids. And so that would be a nice place to explore having abstraction based on comonads that you can then uh, instantiate in different ways. And then you can sort of tie this together with other concepts like uh, distributive laws to capture filters and reduction. Okay, and uh, coming up on time, so we'll move to the last thing uh, that we've, we're working on at the Institute, which is about transparent and explainable computation. And this is uh, uh, my work of, uh, of one of our postdocs, uh, an early career advanced fellow, Roly Pereira, who's also working with Joe Bond at, at Bristol. We have this amazing language called fluid. And the idea there is to look at how this is kind of transparency problem often with data visualizations, sort of, you, you, you've got this computation, you did some stuff, you spit out a graph, you put it in a paper or a news report, and then it's just this static thing. But what if we could have those visualizations be dynamic and interrogatable and explainable so that you could click around on them and get the computational trace and the inputs that reproduced it? And that's exactly what the goal is with Fluid. It's a programming language, but that is automatic. So you can sort of generate these data-driven art, uh, artifacts which reveal, you can kind of click on them and it reveals the relationships between the underlying data and how they were computed. So this is great for explaining things to people, but also good for explaining to yourself and avoiding, you know, did I really compute the right thing here? It makes them much more, makes your programs interrogatable and debuggable in a, in a whole different way. There's also some super cool maths behind this. So it turns out that this kind of relationship about the, the, the provenance and the demands between the inputs and outputs uh, can be described by a Galois connection and, and a junction. And so these compose together to let you build up these analyses inside of the fluid language. And they're, they're exploring how to do this at speed and how to get the computational trace out. And then the idea is to scale this up to, to harder and harder data, data analysis problems, uh, particularly looking at climate. So it's really exciting work uh, that they're doing. Uh, you should go check it out. Okay, so coming into land, I've hit you with three kind of things that are interesting things that actually we could do now, but that need more work and could go in different avenues. So let's bring this back to the idea of, you know, what does programming languages look like for the future of climate modeling? Well, I think they should be science oriented. We should keep the dialogue up between the programming languages research community and the scientists. And I think that's where Julia is being really successful because it has been this thing driven by the science. They need to be array oriented. We work with arrays and that's a really important abstraction. And you can see all of the nice stuff that people have built on top of Python, NumPy, X-Array. There's this really cool library called XGCM, which are building all of these abstractions on arrays for, for working with um, environmental data. And that has to be central. And that is, I think, also part of Fortran's success, having arrays as first class, rather than C having you know, chains of pointers or something. They need to be fast and have predictability in their performance. It's no good having something that runs fast one day, you change a line of code, and then suddenly it's slow because some compiler optimization couldn't trigger anymore. That is very difficult and frustrating for researchers if the performance is kind of non-linear and unpredictable. We're also seeing the importance of machine learning to, to do things like these data-driven subgrid uh, parameterization. So there needs to be that kind of integration. You know, Python, I think, is has had kind of multiple waves of success the, the recent one, because of things like PyTorch and TensorFlow, riding that wave of, of, um, um, of ML use. So it needs to integrate with those uh, and be interactive as well. We see how that's a really powerful um, uh, dominant thing in the use of Python and Julia, using notebooks and REPLs. We've got to deal with the heterogeneous uh, hardware landscape as well. And then hopefully bringing some of the things I've talked about today, having this kind of low commitment to implementation details so you can have abstractions that let you choose different backends, 
bringing in verification through uh, type, different type theories could be even dependent types. They're, we know that they're powerful. It's just making them scale and be usable. Um, and then having that explainability and transparency. So that's a, a vision. Uh, I'm not saying I'm going to make that language that everyone's going to use necessarily, but we shouldn't give up on trying new language ideas and exploring them and, and pushing them and, and then having that influence on other languages, which, which will become popular. Uh, you never know, sometimes things do sprout out of the lab, but I think sort of um, impact by kind of gradually uh, working those ideas into other things is, is the general way. Right, so what I haven't talked about a lot is data and wrangling data. And so I will give you my kind of get up clauses. You should go and listen to Anil Madhavapedi's ICFP 2023 keynote. I've got, the, got a... Um, uh, uh, a QR code there for you to get you to the right point of the, the stream from that. Um, Anil has been doing great work on the uh, data analysis side, ingesting huge amounts of satellite and remote data and building pipelines based on functional programming that let scientists easily plug these things together um, in, in, a, in a workflow that works for them to actually process climate data. And that, that is really integral to a lot of where we're going in the future because uh, the policy decisions and the forecasting and the monitoring rely on us ingesting and cleaning and processing huge amounts of data uh, in, in real time and, and reacting to those. So we need programming tools and languages and systems to help us do that. And, and this is a very nice paper kind of laying out some of that vision as well from uh, Anil's group in Cambridge, uh, his case for, uh, sorry, their case for planetary computing. So Anil and I are actually running a workshop that's at Popple. Popple is the uh, Symposium on Pr uh, Principles of Programming Languages, which is in London in January. We have a workshop there, which is kind of uh, going to be talking about a lot of the things uh, I've been discussing today. Uh, it's going to be one and a half days of invited talks, contributed talks and discussion, bringing people together, looking at how um, concepts from programming languages and mathematics, including abstract uh, mathematics like category theory, uh, can come together to, to help um, build climate models and help decision making. So if you're interested, do come along. There's still time uh, to submit a talk proposal as well. And I, I'm, I'm going to have a, another postdoc position open soon with me at Kent in my programming languages and systems for science laboratory. Uh, so if you're sort of finishing your PhD soon, uh, you might want to have a look at that. So I'm going to end here with, uh, this was the quote we had uh, near the start from Simon's book, uh, still our appreciation of the risks of climate change is limited by the way our academic institutions encourage each researcher to focus on their own narrow area of expertise. So that's really a challenge, isn't it, uh, for academics, who we, we do love to kind of focus on our niche, uh, but we should look more broadly, and that is what the Topaz Institute has been doing uh, for, for a long time. So I, I do commend them in their work that they've certainly been looking more broadly. And I think the kind of areas of uh, applied category theory are, are doing exactly that. It, that the idea is to, to look across the disciplines and work with others. And I'd like to, to leave you with this other final quote, which I think is really a kind of a, a, a specific call to action and a way for us to think about where we are in this system. Any actor should understand their points of leverage. We each have to understand the opportunities presented by our place in the system and do our best to exploit them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dominic. Thank you so much for the excellent talk. And I, I just really like how you, you know, for climate change is a really important topic and, and that, you know, I really like how you're uh, encouraging people to bring their skills in to, to think about our place in the system, as you mentioned, and to do our best to exploit our skills to solve that problem. And I, I think today's talk is a really good uh, explanation of how that's done. So uh, now it's time, we have some time for questions. And uh, as usual, uh, please uh, feel free to raise your hand in the Zoom chat, or you can type your question into the meeting chat and I, I, will, I will read out your question to, to Dominic. So, um, any questions? I see a raised hand. Uh, Valeria, you have a question. Hi, Dominic. That was brilliant. That was brilliant. Thanks so much. Um, You're welcome. I I am actually interested in when at some stage you said something about uh, three challenges, right? Uh, the challenge of scaling up computation, mm -hmm. the collaboration, 
and the communication. So I'm very much interested in the last one, the challenge of communication, mm. uh, especially because, you know, again, if you go back to a slide that has the main equation, the one that has the D, T, and F, which is the one that um, that is worrying somehow, that one, yeah. So the F is kind of lots of four things, right? So there's mm. the there's the things that that you're mentioning there that are all physical, but then of course there is the um, the non-physical forcing functions. So the economics of stuff. Yes. Uh, and so the question is kind of uh, how are you, we going to scale up the communication with the, you know, because of course there's lots of people trying to to come up with vague solutions or, or kind of, you know, well, mm. so, I mean, we, we need yes. to, be, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it, that's a really important topic and there are models where people kind of bring these things together with economic models as well. Mm. Um, uh, the, uh, there's a model called E3ME, excuse me, that came out of researchers in Cambridge and uh, Cambridge Econometrics, um, uh, Jean-Francois Mercure and um, various other people were doing some really nice work uh, bringing these things together, having these um, sort of economic models that are related then to these, these climate aspects. And I, and I think that's incredibly important. And that's like another discipline to work with. Um, I am not an economist and I know a very small amount of uh, things about economics, um, but what I, I suppose what I do know is that there are things that we've done in recent years that perhaps have gone against economic advice, but that have been uh, brilliant. So you think uh, um, solar technology was very expensive a while ago, and the economic theory would say, well, don't put your money into that because it's too expensive. And yet people did and invested, and now it's one of the cheapest sources of electricity we have. The, the cost has just plummeted from all these kind of other scaling things that have happened. So, um, you know, I think this kind of dialogue is really important. And, and you get this concept of what people call digital twins, which are models that often try to integrate more things than just this physical world and have, yes, the economics, the, the non-physical, the, these kind of policy human decision-making factors and, and integrate data together. Um, uh, but I don't don't work with uh, any of those at the moment. But these are really important, and I think it's a, it's again um, we need to some people need to be working across those disciplines and with ec economists. I would recommend Simon Sharp's book. He has a lot of interesting things to say about um, economic modelling and economic decision making, um, oh, which you. are which are very interesting. Thanks. We'll do. Thank, thank you, Valeria and uh, Dominic. So we have some questions from uh, Kevin and Yanis. So uh, Kevin, maybe you can go first and ask your unmute yourself. Okay. Um, thanks, Dominic. Really inspiring talk. Um, I wanted to uh, describe, I guess, kind of how I think we here at Topos are thinking of programming languages and scientific modeling interacting and see whether it feels like it's close to your vision. Um, uh, uh, or, or feels like a different direction. I think it probably feels like it is, but, but phrased a little bit differently. Um, and so I imagine we're probably on the same page that a lot of the most exciting stuff in programming, uh, programming languages research so far, uh, this century on strongly dependently type languages and things for formal verification is stuff that it would be a big lift to get working scientists using on a regular basis. Uh, so I think a lot of our vision at Topos with PL and scientific modeling is to try to provide uh, more flexibility with domain specific languages to scientists to essentially write something that's as close as possible to the math and the blackboard scribbling that they already write for say in decapose.jl library we have for writing down essentially a data structure for a system of couple differential equations. So it looks like writing math on a blackboard. Uh, and then have separate from that a back end that might be Julia, that might be Fortran, um, that might be whatever, whatever you want to um, use and uh, to be able to implement 
uh, interactions between these domain specific languages to let people talk across a range of fields without all having to learn the whole same big new language. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I'm just curious whether you uh, feel like you're seeing any interesting ideas along that line, whether it seems like that's consistent with uh, some of you guys' vision over there. Yeah. Um, so some of the array comonad stuff I described earlier, that, that came out of thinking about really a, a DSL or an embedded DSL for uh, these things, um, sort of a combinator library-like uh, setup. And I think um, really there is there is quite a lot of that in in some sense that gets deployed around the place. These um, these sort of complex libraries and APIs that essentially become a bit like a DSL for people that have to be learned, and people do learn them when they know they're going to get a value out of them. Um, so I think the DSL approach um, can be a great idea. Um, it's 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 an overcoming. The sociological challenges once again of you build something and it's getting people to use it that involves training and and it getting over this sort of critical barrier of ah there's enough people who can see the value here that that they're then kind of going forward and using it um, uh, but I think that I think that could be a could be an approach that works and, and we should we should try that we should keep trying that approach um, and. The, the thing about embedded DSLs, which is which is good, is that they're embedded and they can work in within the languages that you already have. And um, the shallower the embedding, perhaps the easier it is for people to get to grips with. Um, okay, deeper embeddings can also be useful if you really need to, to push things. Um, but I think um, trying to do something that kind of smoothly goes from where people are at and, and brings them forward a bit more. Um, is a good way to go. And actually you can see, I think you can see things a bit like that with um, some of these kind of Python libraries that then bring in, um, they bring in the typing via things like MyPy, they bring in decorators for additional specifications. And it's really going from where you're at and adding in more layers. And I think if we, if we should think about how we can use our existing languages to do that, to build those layers, and what are the languages that will help us do that more easily as well in the future. Um, I think the people coming from the Lisp community will say, oh, you know, that's what Lisp is for. And you can you, know, you build all of these languages on top of it um, using the macro system. And some of that, those kind of ideas have ended up in Julia. So it does have uh, a whole macroing system and a lot of things that people build, uh, kind of build off that to do this sort of hiding of things and build these um, macro systems to, to have sort of DSLs for things. And um, um, so, it's, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm a little bit aware of, uh, the stuff going on at, at Topos Institute uh, with these libraries, Julia-based things for kind of composing together um, uh, different uh, differential equation workflow things. So I, I, I think that's great. I think um, pursuing the DSL approach is is, is good um, and we should do that and keep talking to people and, and finding those right abstractions and having the languages that help us do that. And maybe in the future, scientists will be able to build their own DSLs as well. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. And thank you, Kevin. And yeah, we were, we were to here at Topos. We were really uh, excited we could work together with you on some of these ideas and topics. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of Yanis. Uh, so Yanis' uh, question and comment is that um, he says, I'm worried about, I'm worried how do we solve the problem of garbage in, garbage out? Algorithms look beautiful and they will spit out nice graphs and numbers, but how do we ensure these computations describe reality? And how do we overcome hidden assumptions and biases in our models? How, how do we know we describe nature and not our faulty, partial, limited, and biased, understand, biased understanding of nature? Do you, do you have hmm. a... Um, That's a great question. Um, I will... I'm not a climate scientist, but I think I can give some answer to that. Um, so how do we ensure these computations describe reality? Well, that's the scientific method. We, 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 we have to compare these things against observations at some point. Um, uh, perhaps I can give you a little vignette on, on something that people do, which is to uh, have intermediate complexity models where they look at reproducing uh, well-known, well-studied weather systems but from first principles. So um, 
Uh, an example that I'm pretty familiar with is something called the, the quasi-biennial oscillation, which is uh, there are these winds that go around the equator, which, are, which um, switch direction with a period that's between about 23 and 27 months. It kind of changes. Um, There's a bit of variability, but they, they, they switch around. And they've been uh, well observed for, for decades. And so there's lots of really good observational data about their strength and, and when they flipped. And there's been cool things like uh, weather balloons that have flown through it and things observe various um, phenomena within that. And um, it was um, kind of hypothesized that one of the drivers of these weather systems was something called uh, a gravity wave or a buoyancy wave, which is where you get um, wind going over the mountains, a particular kind of, uh, this is called an orographic uh, gravity wave. And that creates uh, a perturbation but then uh, gravity tries to force that back down and it kind of creates a wave. And then this propagates upwards through the atmosphere. And eventually the, the speed of that wave matches the, the, wind, the wind speed at the top and it deposits its momentum. And eventually this leads to a weakening of the QBO and it flips direction. So what people can do is have a, a model of the atmosphere, a model of the moist atmosphere, which has these gravity waves in it. And it but it doesn't have a model of the QBO but they run it with initial conditions from uh, observational data and are able to reproduce the QBO. So that gives us um, a, a, some good evidence that we understand one of the primary drivers. Maybe it's not everything, but it's that comparison between the observational data and our models. Can our models predict the things that we see in the real world, not just by kind of directly doing it, but from those smaller first principle processes. So lots of examples of these where, where people look at various well-studied weather systems. We have a whole host of really great um, data out there, various things, and um, look at our best understanding and see if those things can be reproduced. And, and from that, learn more things about our models. And our, you know, as I said before, our models are they're always wrong. They're always approximations. They always have some assumptions and they um, always have to throw away some details. Um, but the process of science is then an iterative one and, and trying them in different situations and saying, OK, well, where's this other weather pattern over here is can we reproduce that with this same model? Well, we can't. Well, maybe we need to uh, we need some maybe something else is missing. And it's this social process of science which has gone on for centuries where we where we build these models and compare them against observational data. And I think one of the really great things about something like IPCC is this coming together of lots of different models by lots of different people. So yes, there will be biases and assumptions, but then we take these as an aggregate and that helps us to kind of control uh, some of the, those things and have, well, yes, there may be discrepancies that we get, but it helps us, we can understand the overall trend by taking these things together and bringing, bringing this mean. And uh, this kind of mean uh, prediction. But you also get things where you can do sort of um, weighted or biased means saying, oh, well, this model has some problems over here with this particular, it has difficulties with this particular kind of behavior. So we'll weight it differently um, in these circumstances. So a lot of really cool statistical techniques for kind of overcoming uh, perhaps weaknesses in models. Um, they might just be there because they're kind of very sensitive to certain kinds of conditions. So using sort of statistical techniques to deal with this when you build these, these multi-model means. Um, so I think there's lots of kind of cool stuff going on to sort of deal with that. And uh, always lots of people interrogating their models, uh, understanding uh, why they do certain things, um, how they behave in different circumstances. And of course, our, our understanding is limited, but that's why we're doing it. And we're, we're building this kind of shared understanding of, of our world and, and we've learned a lot but still lots more to learn uh, thank you what, what, what i was going is to the dichotomy of equation based modeling which is what you described versus like i think a new trend which is data based and mm. equation agnostic modeling so you take the data and then you try to do kind of like a runge kuta type of algorithm you're trying to fish out what terms are in the equation instead of doing kind of like an approximate and an, an approximated physical based approach and then you say okay here is my navier stokes equation and or here is my wave equation and then i'm trying to fit that to the data so this is kind of like the opposite like neural network based 
modeling based on just the data and equation agnostics. What's your opinion on that? And do you think, do you see any promise in that, any convergences or divergences with the, with the paradigm you described? Thank you. Uh, great, yeah. Um, so there are a bunch of these data-driven approaches um, and some of them can be very black box. It's really just throw all of this data at this, um, that use it to train, uh, say, a convolutional neural network. And then you get something out that is a, a sort of a pattern recognition prediction system that's black box. But there are techniques for then um, trying to understand, trying to kind of get explainability out of that. So there's a sort of whole host of um, techniques from the machine learning statistics world of, of explainable AI to sort of extract the meaning from that. Like how, how did um, these different parts of this output um, sort of where did they come from in this model? Which bits contributed to this particular prediction? I mean, I think, I think philosophically, the data-driven approach, um, if you don't then interrogate it, well, you, you have to go into it knowing this is a black box and it, it's not replaced, it's not giving you necessarily a scientific, or it doesn't necessarily give you a strong scientific understanding. What you might do is train it with different variables and use that to, to work out what are the primary drivers of this mechanism. So it gives you a bit, you can sort of use it as a, well, what things contributed to this, but then it perhaps doesn't let you understand the base mechanisms, but that might be okay in some situations if maybe there are things we understand, but we, we know we want to do this thing a lot faster to get these particular kind of ensemble runs. So I, I think it, I think you do have to go into these things with your eyes open, understand the limitations of what you're doing. But I think there are techniques out there for helping you kind of unpick this again. And there are also other cool bits of machine learning they get getting done where, for equation discovery. So it's not just we get a black box, but it's, uh, or here's a massive matrix of weights and that's the model. But uh, there, are, there are approaches that actually, okay, here's, here's the equation which we fit uh, to this thing. Um, perhaps there's a bit more like, you're saying with you know we, we have this equation work out the coefficients but there are there are some um there are some approaches that are trying to do this more of this white box gray box idea which we get something out that we um that we can actually uh interrogate a bit more and understand what the model is um you say i love the antin antin antinomy keep your eyes open to the black box I exactly yeah i mean you got to know what you're doing what tools you're using and what their advantages and disadvantages are Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Yanis. Um, so in the interest of time, um, I'm going to field two more questions. Uh, we have a question from the Topos uh, seminar room and then a, a question from Patrick. So uh, maybe um, I'll, I'll open the uh, Topos seminar room. Can you uh, unmute yourself and ask the question? Um, yeah. So in you have this list of uh, like a bunch of different features that you want to see in the programming language of, of 2030. Um, and one thing that I noticed that was missing from that, oh yeah. Uh, I'll just oh. jump to it. Yep. Um, is, is computer algebra. So, it, and you could have, you could have had a CF dot Mathematica, um, <laughs> or, 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 um, in, in the Julia ecosystem, we have SciML. And I think that the, one of the advantages of computer algebra is you can sort of start from a relational perspective, which is you, you talked about, yeah, back in the, back in the good old days, um, scientists had equations and then you can factor your relation into a, a function, which is known as solving for variables. Um, and and I think that th there's there's a I find this very intuitive because as a scientist we we see relations like a priori we don't know that any variable is a function of of any other variable those those are relationships that are postulated yeah um but but you often see like in, in thermodynamics for instance. Like with, with classical thermodynamics, you have five var variables, energy, pressure, temperature, um, volume, and entropy. And you can like make 
uh, three of like any three of them functions of the other two. Um, but but sort of a priori, there's like no natural choice for that. Um, yeah, so I was wondering what your your thoughts on like relational modeling through computer algebra are is. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's yeah. Perhaps that is slightly missing from this list because, but that goes back to the the this sort of um, this lack of a semantic relationship that I was talking about earlier between between say you start with this abstract model and then you have this implementation and and where's the connection? Where's those refinement steps that you did are lost? Um, and it would be really great to have something where you could really work in the the equational sort of algebraic setting and and have your computational kind of constructive representation of that that you could kind of interrogate and do things with and have that somehow connected to the oh yeah but now i need to run this fast on my supercomputer um and i think that that's that's really kind of missing or at least we don't know how to do that in an effective way but i think you're absolutely right having that kind of that way that you can explore and interrogate the mathematics that's um that's relational that isn't committed to these details is something that that can be really powerful um, and that we should absolutely have. And then I think the, 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 the golden egg would be, how do we connect that then with the, the implementations? Um, there is really beautiful stuff that I didn't mention about these, these really neat things like the, the, um, the Phoenix project. Um, and uh, it has another thing that came out of it where these are sort of DSLs where you describe the PDEs and it does a lot of it does automatic solving things for you, but you work in this very uh, you you write you're writing the equation right as a as a syntax tree um, in Python, and then you do various things to it, and you get the numerical model approximation out of it for you. So you can kind of work in this sort of much more explorative fashion and have stuff automated, which is also really great. Um, it would be amazing to see if that could be scaled up to this situation. The difficulty is you then have to bring it together with lots of other things. So, um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think having languages that let us play in that relational mathematical space are, are, are great and, and what we need for kind of this abstract thinking. Uh, and then what I'm thinking here is, you know, how do you connect that back to, and now I need to run the fast, the, run the fast thing at the end and get out the data to put into the next report. Cool. But have those things linked. Yeah. Um, have you ever heard of Silene? Silene? It's it's this library for scientific computing in, in Lean. Um, ah, oh, Silene. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of. I'm sort of aware of these. I, I'm I've not really used Lean, but I'm aware that people are building up a lot of cool stuff there. Um, yeah, they they have this very interesting. They sort of use the Lean tactic system to like start from an equation and then iteratively refine that equation into a a like runnable model it, it's very yeah. it's neat. and I, I think maybe it's it's along it's along those lines of, of maybe. No, that sounds awesome i i yeah. didn't know they were quite at that level so there, this relates to something i didn't mention but there was a really great paper uh by sylvie boldo and a few others from inria where they did something very like this um where they started with uh, but i think it was all in in um, the, the Koch theorem prover, I think they, they started with the sort of 1D wave equation and they had all of the, the numerical analysis sort of lemmas and theorems all built up in their theorem prover so that they could do all of the steps for all the things you do in numerical analysis and to the discrete approximation, um, approximation, sorry. And then they had the C code, which was then interwoven with um, from a C, which is sort of deductive, um, frameworks, you could have these pre and post conditions that then generated these verification conditions that matched them with the, the, the theorem proving stuff and had things automatically discharged and other things you had to do manually. And it was kind of this idea of how do you go end to end from the partial differential equation to a fast C code and make sure it's fully verified. You did all the maths right, you did all the dis approximation right, you did all the implementation right, and they're all coherent. And that's really beautiful. It's about six months of work for four experts in theorem provers and programming languages. 
Could we get to a point where people could do that? It sounds like the lean thing is a step on that journey if it's all within one system and it's this kind of refinement, da, 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 which is great. I'm yeah, still trying yeah. to question out whether that is what climate scientists need or not. That is a very high level of assurance that could take a very long time to get. And I'm still, I'm not saying it's not, but I'm still trying to get my head around the what well, level of verification is important, but maybe more the connection between the ideas that's important. The, the interesting thing about the lead project is that they're like really not concerned about verification. Their, their proofs are just like sorry everywhere. Um, like they don't, they don't prove anything. That ba basically they're just trying to harness the tactic system and the dependent types, not to prove things, but to guide this iterative expansion of, of the <laughs> equation. So I, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that like great. approaches like that, where you're like, okay, okay. Like in theory, we could prove all of this, but there, there's still, there's, there's a lot of value in just like the interactivity of a proof assistant mm. without the actual proof part. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I agree. Actually, this I skipped over this because I was just thinking I'm I'm talking too long. But this last point, integration with program synthesis tooling, it's, mm. it's kind of that that kind of that like proof search, right? And having that automation. Yeah, yeah, yeah that sounds great. I mean, uh, thank you. I will delve a bit more into what they're doing. It sounds really cool and sounds thanks. definitely in line with what I'm thinking about. Uh, thanks, Owen, and thanks, Dominic. I I want to respect uh, Dominic's time. And um, maybe we have, we actually have more questions, but um, I think Patrick, you, you, uh, you'll you be the last one. And I've told some of the others that they could prob probably email you, Dominic, um, with yeah. their questions. Yeah. Uh, so Patrick, yeah, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Cool, thank you. Um, great talk, thank you very much. Um, I'm curious, uh, like, I mean, it's very along the lines that uh, that this last question, I mean, that, that we've been talking about. Um, so it's like, it seems like it's very important or it would be very important to be able to model effects of these like sort of accidental things. So understanding like the, you know, the, the impact of setting, say um, your like grid scale to some, to, to some scale. And then like, and, and having subgrid um, processes done by some neural network and then like say change that scale and have it done. And you'd want to see some hopefully consistency between the two is, are there general sort of frameworks um, that you know of that that kind of deal with like it's kind of complementary really to like this this other kind of level of structure that we that that we've been talking about? It seems like where it's like you actually take all that stuff into consideration and and you're like allowed you're somehow able to model the effects of of these accidental implementation details, um, you know, and and manage them and maybe compare structure then you know between things. But yeah. I'm not aware of any framework that, that really deals with that. Um, there, there might be, but I'm not aware of one. And I think you know, you're pointing to a problem of, of sort of effects of scale. You know, you change the scale of one part, how how does another how does another part of that deal deal how does another component deal with that? And that is often a challenge where you then have to do things like interpolation, like, okay, these these components just work at different resolutions now. Or I train this neural net at this resolution uh, and now we're going to run it at a different resolution. Hopefully that should be fine. Hopefully it should be sort of invariant to those things. But uh, you know, is it? <laughs> um, and I don't think there's a lot of good sort of automated ways for understanding that. And, and often these things are quite sort of implicit in the code as well. They take a lot of careful thought. We, some of the things we've been involved in uh, are something along the lines of, you've got um, a GCM, a big GCM, you've got an idealized model, you've built a, um, a subgrid model in the idealized thing and it performs quite well. You want to take it out and put it into the GCM now. But the atmospheric variables are different, the resolution's different, the time steps are different. You have to do all kinds of conversions and interpolation. And then you get to the point of, well, did what I, is this thing generalizable? Um, is it actually performing in this context better? Um, and I, I believe, I don't know everything in this field, but I believe there's not any uh, really kind of framework that helps you with that. 
other than having lots of documentation and 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 thinking very carefully and, and, and having the experts who spend all their time thinking about these things. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. And thank you, Patrick, for your question. I think, uh, yeah, let's thank Dominic again for a really interesting talk. And as I, I think we had a wonderful discussion here. And uh, thanks, everyone, for for uh, attending the Topos co Colloquium. And um, like again, uh, I will be posting Dominic's slides on the uh, Topos Colloquium website after this. And uh, if you have more questions, please uh, feel free to email uh, Dominic. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you once again. You're welcome. Thank, thank you so you. much for having me. It's been great. Cheers. I'll See send you more questions. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. Bye now. Bye. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm going to end the Zoom call now. Thank you so much.